Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus. And we just thank you that you're here with us this morning. We thank you that we're here with one another. Thank you for giving us the body of Christ, this church together under one roof, and we worship your name. And so, Father, I just pray today that you would do something amazing in our hearts and our lives, Lord. I thank you for our children, Lord, that they're being raised up in the way they should go, that when they're old, they will not depart from it. The Father next door to us are the future world changers, Lord. And we just speak life to them today and speak the power of God into their classes. God, we just thank you for what you're doing in us today. In Jesus' precious name, everybody agrees, amen. Come on, give God some praise. Come on. You can go by that one more time. Come on. There you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, if you can do me a favor, turn around, say hi to somebody next to you, then you can grab your seats. City Point. I'm Maddie, and we are so glad that you're with us today. If this is your first time with us, make sure to text the word welcome to 972-460-9235. It's the best way to get in touch with our team and learn more about us. As we continue the service, we just want to take a minute and bring you up to speed on everything that's going on here at City Point. So check this out. We love highlighting our awesome volunteers on our Point team who use their gifts and talents to serve families every week here at City Point. Today, we got another Point Team power couple, Daniel and Sarah Savazan, who together serve at our City Kids Elementary Ministry. Daniel says, I love serving in City Kids because as I share the gospel, it gives me the opportunity to watch the Holy Spirit work in the lives of our children. I can often feel the Spirit moving and I absolutely adore watching the kids' eyes light up as they begin to understand the full extent of God's love for them. As John says in 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And City Kids gives me the perfect opportunity to see it happen every single Sunday. Not to be outdone, Sarah shares, serving in City Kids always allows me to pour gospel into young hearts and watch the Holy Spirit move in their lives. I also love singing and dancing and playing games with them and listening to all the ways they can love God and love others. I hold on to God's promise in Proverbs 22, 6, which says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I am so thankful to help support and grow the church's future leaders and have a super fun time at Kids Camp. Satizans, we are eternally grateful that couples like yourselves are pouring into our children every single Sunday. Y'all are amazing and we believe God will honor your sacrifice as you are loving on his children. Daniel and Sarah are just two of countless volunteers that love serving you and your family, but they could definitely use some help. If you'd like to join a team, head over to citypointchurch.com slash volunteer and see all the different ways you can get involved in a point team. We are pretty confident that there's an area you'd be great at that would impact many lives here at City Point. We're in the middle of our teddy bear drive for the Children's Advocacy Center, who use the bears to help provide hope and healing to children victimized by abuse and neglect in the Collin County area. Parents, this is a fantastic opportunity to teach your kids about loving on other individuals. Go out and have your child pick out a bear, pray over it as a family, and bring it to our donation bin in the City Kids Lobby. The last day of collection will be happening Sunday, September 26th. If you are new to church or just new to City Point, we want to invite you to Connection Point on Sunday, September 26th from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. It's our membership class that takes place every six weeks where we talk about our vision at City Point, healthy habits of a believer, and how to make a difference in the world you live in. Dinner and child care will be provided. So if you're interested, head over to citypointchurch.com slash connection point and register today. Last thing, guys, pay attention. Now is your chance to prove that your chili is the best chili. Lionheart, our men's ministry here at City Point, is having our second annual tailgate and chili cook-off on Saturday, October 2nd at 
5 p.m. The winner will be crowned the Chili Champion and receive a prize package to celebrate their victory. You can register your entry in the Chili Cook-Off at citypointchurch.com slash events. Even if you aren't registering to cook-off, still register, because y'all are going to have a blast with fun games and giveaways planned, as well as a powerful worship moment and a message by Pastor Eddie. The night is free and open to all of you guys from middle school age and up. So what are you waiting for? Register your spot for the Lionheart, Tailgate, and Chili Kickoff today. That's everything going on at City Point. If you missed something or you have any questions, you can always talk to our team at the info desk or shoot us an email at info at citypointchurch.com. Now, let's welcome Pastor Eddie to the stage as he continues our series, You're Not Far. Good morning once again. Glad you guys made it to church today on our Super Sunday. I'm sure your kiddos are having fun. Uh, before I totally jump into the message, I want to just, and they already mentioned it, but I just want to give you my two cents. Uh, is the men's tailgate coming up and the chili cook-off? I really encourage you, men, get out of the house. Wives, lock your husbands out of the house for the night. Uh, give them no reason to stay at home. Uh, and let, men, we'd love to see you here. We're going to do a little bit of worship, some word, and then we're going to have a chili cook-off, and we have a couple things out there. We're just going to have a good time and hang out. Weather should be perfect. Uh, it'll be October, so summer's almost over in October. And, um, and then we can have a good time together. So make plans now. It's on a Saturday night from 5 to about 8, so you'll be getting home early. Um, but we'd love to see you there. And then also we have Connection Point coming up um, from 5 to 8 o'clock on the 26th. And, you know, if you've been kind of hanging around the church a little bit, say, man, I, <clears throat> I feel like this could be our home, um, then I encourage you to come to Connection Point. One of the things I love is the last about 45 minutes of it, we get to have a dinner, and we just get to sit down with everybody and just get to know you a little bit better. And so we'd love to see you there if you haven't registered for that. Now, we're in this series called You're Not Too Far, and uh, kind of I was praying over our fall schedule, what we would do. Um, this series, I just felt like <clears throat> God put on my heart simply for the fact is I feel like people, there's people in our church that need to know they're not too far, that it's not as far as you think to what God has for you, and God's not as far as away as you think. <clears throat> I think for some of us, you know, it's, it's we think the, the beginning is the tough part, or even the middle is the tough part. It's really not. The beginning is exciting. You man, I, I have this dream God's placed in my life and, and I have this whatever and I'm in the, you know, going for it, kind of in the middle. You can still see how far you've come and, and think, wow, look how far I've come since I started this journey. But it's once you reach past that middle point and you can't see the end that sometimes it begins to feel like it's just too far to go. And I think sometimes when we, we look at moments like that, that's when it requires our trust in God. And it requires a little bit of grit in your soul to keep pushing through in those moments. So today I want to look at a, uh, what happens to a dream. I mean a real God-given dream. Uh, the desire, and I'm not talking about you simply just want to have success in life because God's blessing is not stuff. God's blessing is you walking in his purpose. And there's a difference in your life. If you have things but you have no purpose, you're not blessed. And even if you have things and you don't use them for God's purpose, you're not blessed. The blessing is taking God's purpose and using the skills and all the things that God's placed in your life to move forward his kingdom. And so I want to talk to you about an anatomy of a God-given dream. And we're going to look at what that looks like. And, and it's a story that you're probably going to be familiar with, but I think it's worth looking at today. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus. And I thank you for today. I thank you for this moment in time. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that's going to come and bring this word to life. 
pray for those online and those sitting in this room. The Father, they'll not just hear my voice, but Father, they'll hear your voice. In fact, we position ourselves to listen to you. Convict us, encourage us, strengthen us today, God. Father, we need you. Father, we come with vessels that need to be filled, with hearts that need to be strengthened. So, Father, I pray that you'd work in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. When we talk about you're not too far, I think we all have the potential, if we don't understand how close we are to the end, that sometimes we can step away from the dream God's place in our life and basically abort that plan. But I think what's critical in our life, especially when we can't see the beginning and we're way past the middle, but we don't know where the end is, is that it takes something in us to allow us to finish the way that God wants us to finish. And so today I want to take a look at a story that you're probably familiar with if you've been around church for a while. It's the story of a man named Joseph. And Joseph was the favorite son of his dad, Jacob. And the reason Jacob, uh, he was the favorite son of his dad uh, is because his mom, Rachel, was Jacob's favorite wife. I guess if you have multiple, you have to have a favorite. And so in this case, Rachel was his favorite wife, and Joseph was the firstborn of that wife. Now, Jacob was about 74 years old when Joseph arrived, and the nation of Israel was in development. Jacob and Joseph are the, uh, are the relatives, are the, come from the lineage of Abraham, which is also the lineage of Christ, which is also Abraham was the father of the nation of Israel. And so when we look at this, what we have to understand is that Jacob as the son of jo- or Joseph as the son of Jacob came from a family history that had a purpose and had a potential in God. Now Jacob, when he came out, Scripture gives us this detail about when he was born, that he grabbed on to the heel of his brother Esau and would not let go. And when that took place, they put a ribbon around his wrist and they named him Jacob, which means supplanter. Or in other words, he's a schemer, he's a deceiver, he takes things that aren't his. And Jacob lived up to that name. Later in life, as the boys got older, uh, Scripture gives us a story that he stole his brother Esau's birthright. And and when he did this, he began to really, what it reveals to me is that, that Jacob had this dream in his heart, but he was going after this dream in his own effort. And this is the key that we have to understand about a God-given dream is that we still sometimes have a dream, but we try to go at that dream outside of God's plan and his will and his ways. And anytime we try to go after God's dream for our lives outside of his will and his ways, we make a mess of our lives. His desire that Jacob had aligned with God's desire for him, but his fleshly ways did not. And so what happened as Jacob's trying to become this, he feels this yearning in his heart that he's supposed to be somebody he's supposed to be. What he's doing is scheming and trying to make that thing take place in his life. And here's the truth about about doing the will of God in our life and just about life in general. If you do it the wrong way, you're going to get wrong results. You're not going to do it the wrong way and get the right results. You're not going to do it in your flesh and get God results in your life. But that was the destiny of Jacob. That's what he tried to do. When we try to reach, at our, reach out to our dream outside of God's help, we make a mess. And so, uh, it, it, and sometimes we do that by saying, well, if, it doesn't ha- if I don't make it happen, it's just not going to happen. It's all on me. And that was the life that Jacob lived. Now, ultimately, what we understand is that he was, um, that by doing that, he stole his brother's birthright. He had to run because he was afraid of his brother's revenge. And a lot of times in life, what Jacob's life is our story, that if we just go after a dream but not in God's way, sometimes we we burn bridges. Uh, We we do things into our life that make a mess on our process of doing that dream. And that was Jacob's story. And so what we see is that Jacob was good at holding on to what he wanted, but he didn't always hold on to it the right way. It's kind of like believers just trying to do it all on their own, not trusting in God to bring about things in their life. And what really ultimately what happened with Jacob is he ran away from his, his family, ran away from his brother just because he was afraid of the revenge. At some point in his life, he got married, and, and he just started to miss home, and he started to have regrets. And day after day, the longer he was away from home, the more he wanted to go home, but he had a problem is that he didn't know how his brother would treat him if he came back to his homeland. And so scripture gives us this detail that he decided to take his family. It's a longer story than what I'm telling, but he decides to head back home to be with his, where his family roots are and where the, the homestead is, all that kind of stuff. And he's going to, on his way to see Esau. And that night on that journey there, he separated himself from his family and he just had like a moment alone. And scripture says that while he did that, an angel came and wrestled with him. 
And all of a sudden, Jacob found himself doing to this angel exactly what he did to his brother Esau. He grabbed a hold of this angel, and he says, I will not let go of you unless you bless me. That heart of Jacob that says, I'm not letting go of what I want, was something that God liked. But this time, he was holding on to the right thing. He was wrestling with God. And Scripture says that he would not let go of this angel. And so God not only blessed him, but Scripture says it renamed him. He went from a supplanter and a stealer to one who wrestles with God. He gave him the name Israel. And in that process where he shifted his dreams from, from his ability to do it to God's ability to do it, his dream, therefore, started to move forward because he wrestled with God to see that dream take place. And he became Israel, that is now the father of Joseph. And so we kind of see in our, in our lives that we have these two ways to go about getting our dreams. We can do it on our own, stress out, worry, cut corners, do whatever we have to do to make it happen, or we can position ourselves in a way that trusts God, that we trust God, to, to, we have a higher commitment to God than we do to our dream. So when we're pursuing our dream, we're actually pursuing God, and if we have to pick between the dream and God, we always pick God. And that's what God was trying to get out of Jacob. Stop running after your dream and deceiving and trying to take it and, and burn bridges. He says, come to me, pursue me, and I'll deliver the dream into your hands. And so there's two ways we can ultimately get our dreams in our life. One, we can make it happen in our flesh. We can stress out, yell, do all the things that we do, cut some corners, you know, do what we got to do. And that's one way to get a dream. And people do that all the time. This world is filled with people who, who wrestle with man for their dream. But the second way that we learn through Jacob, Joseph's father, is we can trust God and walk in his power and wrestle with God to receive our dream. And when we talk about dreams, there's only one of two ways you're doing it. Either you're wrestling with God and believing God for it and, and seeking him above your dream, or you're wrestling in your flesh for that dream to take place. And so Jacob, as Joseph's father, really kind of set the tone of the story of Joseph. Now what we see about Joseph, and this is who I want to talk about today, he was continuing the legacy that started with Abraham to build the nation of Israel. And this moment of Joseph being born and what Joseph is about to do will be a turning point in the development of that nation. Now, Joseph was his dad's favorite. You say, how do we know that he was his dad's favorite? Because he said he was his favorite. The Bible tells us that. So no guessing games at that dinner table. Who's your favorite dad, Joseph? No, just so y'all know for sure, I'm going to give him a jacket that I will not give to any of y'all. Just so you know, Joseph is my favorite. All of y'all at best are number two. Now, if you didn't think that that created tension in a family, I don't know if you had a family growing up. Now, I don't know if you, if you're, if you have a couple kids, you would understand that tension of rivalry between siblings. Maybe you grew up in a home with a sibling and you understand that rivalry. Uh, Jew and I, we have three kids, but two of our kids were born 16, 17 months apart, and that's simply because Julie could not leave me alone. Like, I just, we just, we had babies, right? So there we were. So we had, the, we, these, we had these two kids, and our girls were close enough that they liked the same thing. And so I'm not, they're not in the room, so I can say these things. So there was a very genuine competition for a long time between them, especially when it came to birthdays and Christmas. So at Christmas, they would go around and check the tree and count presence. And if the number did not match, doesn't matter what's in the box, just the number of presents had to match and they would divide them up and count, right? Now, as I got older, they got more subtle and then they became like a checkout clerk, like a target. And they just kind of rang up the total in their head and they'd be like, I sure hope that one costs more because she's winning right now, you know? And then later, then Hudson came along and he kind of diffused it. But I still think there's some of that in, the, in my girls. I love them, but, but that's, that's what was happening there. And so Joseph had this dream. And he had this dream that was a crazy dream, considering that his brothers hated him. He had this dream that one day his family would bow before him, that he would lead his family, that even his dad would bow before him one day. And even his dad just kind of challenged him and said, son, that's out there that you think me and your mom are going to bow before you one day. But it did not stop God from giving the youngest brother this dream this dream that he would rule all of his older brothers, including his dad. And this did not help his relationship with his brothers. In fact, it stirred a fire that got out of control in their family. Genesis 37 says, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they saw it. It wasn't hidden. It wasn't subtle. They all knew dad loves Joseph more than any of us. They hated him, and they could not speak a kind word to him. 
So here's Joseph, dad's favorite, hated by his 10 brothers. They couldn't say anything nice to him. He got up in the morning, he was insulted. He did anything like, you're so, I mean, whatever those unkind words, they just kept him rolling all day long. 10 siblings all day long, never said anything nice to Joseph. The only thing he had was a fancy coat and his dad's favor. And here's Joseph that being hated by his brothers and God decides to do something. In verse 5, Joseph had a dream. And then Joseph decided, you know what, you losers, I'm going to tell you what my dream is. I'm going to rule over all of y'all. My fancy coat, you know. And so this, it says, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers, they hated him all the more. This sealed the deal of Joseph's fate in the eyes of the brother. Not only were his dad favorite, but now he has dreams that he's going to rule over us. In many ways, the context the dream was, giving, it was given to into made it even harder to believe. It'd be one thing if the family applauded Joseph and thought, wow, we think Joseph's going to do great things in life. Like, we think he could rule the world. We think he could be the best of all of us. Even dad's like, wait, man, well, I think one day I'll work for you, man. You're so great. You're such a powerful son. You're, you're so gifted and all that. That was not the context that God gave this dream in. It were 10 men that hated him, one guy that loved him, and the tension, you could cut it with a knife in that family. But God dropped a dream out of context into, that, into Joseph's heart. That dream did not fit his circumstances. And this is so often how God drops a dream into our heart. He did it in this 70-year-old man that named Joseph that was the youngest of them all. God dropped something in there that did not fit his circumstances at all. And this is the very first thing. Dreams arrive out of context. A God-given dream does not need the circumstances to look, to look, uh, to be, to, to look favorable for it. You can be a barren couple, tried for years, and God drops a dream. I want you to have a baby. You're going to have a baby. There's no reason to believe that dream could come true. You can be a 25-year-old single woman and all you know is old married people and you want to get married and all of a sudden God drops this dream that one day you're going to be married. It just, it's out of context. But who? I ain't marrying these people. Where am I going to find them? Like, like fall from the sky? I mean, he'd be dead by the time he hit the ground, right? So how's that going to happen? Maybe you have a dream to be a business owner, but you're working two or three jobs just to make ends meet right now. Maybe you're praying that you're, you're the wife and you're coming to church and you're praying that your husband will get saved or your kids will get saved, but nobody wants to come to church with you. And you just say, God, why do I have this dream? It's like a burden that I carry around that one day this will take place in my life. Maybe you're sick and the doctor's reports keep getting worse, but you really truly believe in your heart that there's a miracle in your future. God's dreams take place out of context in your life. In other words, if it's a God dream, you have no good reason to believe it except it comes from God. And we have to be okay that God drops things in our heart that don't fit the rest of our life. But that is a handprint and a fingerprint of God. Romans says it this way. For this is the hope we are, that we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? It'd be like me saying, man, I wish I had a pulpit. If I had like a black pulpit that I could put my iPad on, that's a dream that I have. I sure wish God would give that to me one day. Well, I have one. It's right here. I could take this home with me after church and preach in the mirror. It'd be weird, but I could do it. I don't have to hope that it could happen. I could just be like, I'm out. I'm gone. I'm taking my pulpit and going home. That's not hope. Hope is something you can't have your hands on. Hope is something you can't touch. Hope is something you can't afford. Hope is a door that you can't unlock. Hope is a prison you can't get out of. Hope is a baby that you've tried to make, but it just doesn't show up. Hope is something that you can't touch, you can't see, but it's there, and it's like something, a heartbeat on the inside of you. You know one day it'll take place. You just can't make it happen. It's hope. But if we hope for what we do not have yet, we do what? We wait patiently for it. What is a dream? A dream is a blueprint driven, drawn by hope. A dream is a blueprint drawn by hope. In other words, God says, right now, you're not living in this house, but this is what it's going to be like. This is where the door is going to be. This is where the bedroom is going to be. This is where the bathroom is going to be. There's going to be a stone finish on that fireplace and a winding driveway. I can tell you all about it. I can describe it to you. You just don't have it. You just have to hope that one day this blueprint will turn into a reality in your life. It takes a heart fueled by hope to walk in a God dream. It takes a heart that can hang on. It takes a heart that chooses to keep dreaming when the dream gets getting attacked in your life. Do you have a dream like that? I mean, a dream. I mean, it's almost embarrassing. You don't tell a lot of people because they're going to look at you and be like, oh, yeah, 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 you have that dream. You're afraid people would laugh. I've had dreams like that. I still have one. 
I don't even, I didn't tell my wife, and one day God kind of revealed it, and it's hidden. It's private. Because only God can do it, and I'm afraid to tell people about it. It's a dream. I appreciate that Joseph embraced his dream when family gave him nothing but a hard time. His family made him feel like that dream is so impossible. I think a dream born out of context is a good thing. Dreams like that have to be born in faith. Dreams like that are babies, that God conceives them in your heart, and he takes who you are and takes who he is, and he creates a dream that looks like both of y'all. It's God's dream for you, but it looks a lot like you. It has your eyes. It has your pace of walk. It's your dream that God made with you. Don't dismiss the dream simply because it's, you're not standing in it right now. And don't dismiss a dream simply because you can't make it happen. Keep in mind, when God arrived on this planet, he didn't show up as a, a ruling king. He showed up as a vulnerable baby born in a manger, a dream hidden by poverty, unseen by man. Men would not recognize him as a savior for 30 years, but the dream was, heart was beating for 30 years before man ever recognized it. God shows up in the hidden things, the quiet things. He comes from behind and he wins the race. That's who God is. The next journey for Joseph is a really bad point. Now, the brothers are totally done with him. The family decides, you know what, that, that, that we're done with you, and we begin to plot against him. And that was the brothers' decision as they decided we're, we're angry and we want him dead. It was like a story from Dateline. Like it was a family of 11 brothers, a Jewish family, quiet, living on a farm. And then something happened. One of the brothers disappeared. You know, and then they start showing the brothers. They check their, you know, it's like a story. So the brothers get together. They're all out doing dad's business. They're all shepherding. They see Joseph coming. They say, well, there's the dreamer. And they decide, we are so sick of him. Let's murder him. That was their plan. Ten brothers, let's kill our youngest brother. That was their, that was their idea for the day, which makes you feel good about yourself if you think you have a dysfunctional family. At least all your children aren't plotting to kill one and throw it in a well, to your knowledge, right? But that was their idea. And so as Joseph's coming, they, they decided, and then all of a sudden one of the brothers decided, you know what, I don't know if our murder pack is that good of an idea. I mean, what are we going to gain by just murdering him? Let's see what else we can do with him. So let's just throw him in a dry well until we can figure out what to do with him. And so scripture says they threw him into a dry water well in the middle of that desert. And Joseph's body hit like a thud into the bottom of that well. Can't imagine what damage was done to his body as he did that. And I can't imagine him trying to climb his way out and claw his way out of those clay walls. But there Joseph was. His brothers were happy to see him in the bottom of that well. In fact, they all decided, let's just go eat and celebrate that we threw him in that pit. Which, which you know, speaking of family trouble, we're, we're having a, a thing called a parenting master class on October. The, I thought this was the best way to promote it because you're like, I think that could happen in my home. I think it is, Eddie. <laughs> we have a parenting master class. We've hired a doctor to come in who's a psychiatrist and a family therapist, and he's going to come in. He's going to speak for about 30 minutes that Sunday morning, and then we have a master class that night, about an hour long with questions and answers, and he's going to help you very practical and applicable. He's faith-based. He believes what we believe, and so he wants to help you raise your kids in this crazy world, and we as a church are, are paying him to come and be a part of us to help you, and so it's October the 2nd. If you have family and friends that have kids and the kids are crazier than yours, invite them to come. We'll prepare kids' <laughs> church that day, and we want to help you raise your kids in this crazy world. We do not want you to be on day line with your family like Jacob's family was about to be and so they decided they they imagined this they threw him in this well plotting of not to kill him but what to do with him there and the scripture says they all sit down to eat so they're just laughing having the best time and as they're eating their lunch that day they hear the noise of a caravan coming through the valley and if you've ever been out in nature when it's quiet like that you can hear something miles away coming and so they heard the caravan coming and they made this decision Genesis 37 they said this, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? So what do we have to gain from murdering him? That's a good pragmatic question. Come, let's do this. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him. After all, he's our brother. So they started to feel a little guilty. He's flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. So they said, instead of just murdering him, let's just sell him into slavery for the rest of his life. Take his freedom. Take that fancy little jacket off of him. And let's just sell him into slavery for the rest of his life. That's what, that's what we think we should do. And that's exactly what they did. And so they sold Joseph, who had this dream to rule his family, stripped of his coat, hated by his brothers. Now he's a slave walking behind a camel through the desert, being led off to Egypt to be sold. 
And he was sold to a man by the name of Potiphar. Now, Potiphar was a, le a level of leadership there in the nation of, of, of Egypt, and Joseph was now their, ha their house servant, and he was taking care of it. Now, Potiphar was so busy doing Potiphar stuff, they didn't have time to go to XO conference, and so Miss Potiphar got a little, you know, kind of got her eyes wide open and started looking around for a younger man, and she found Joseph, and so she's like, hey, Joseph, come over here, baby. Like, let's go sit down and talk. I need a back rub. You know, like, she's just trying to get on all over him, and she grabbed his coat, and he's like, nah, nah, I can't do that. And he ran off, and she kept his coat. That's exactly how it happened. I read the Bible. <laughs> and then, uh, she, she, when she, then she got mad that she got rejected, and then she applied fake rape charges to him, and dad came, the husband came along and said, you know what, if you're going to try to do that to my wife, I, I, I should kill you. But he ultimately threw, her in, threw him in jail, which I think he probably knew Miss Potiphar was a little, eh. And so he decided, you know what, I'm not going to kill you because she's probably tried that before. I'm just going to throw you in jail. And so here's Joseph, hated by his brothers, bound into slavery, now accused of rape and falsely imprisoned. And now he's in prison. His dream had put him in prison. And this is the second thing I have to say about a God-given dream, and this may be where you're at right now, is every dream has a trial by fire. Every dream that's given by God has a trial by fire. He gives the dream, and then he goes on to refine the vessel. He refines our motives. He refines our, refines our faith. He refines our character. He refines our attitude. He refines the fact that are we faithful in the little so he can make us faithful in much. We talk often about trusting in God, but God also has to trust in us with what he gives us. And there's a process in God's dream in your life where he decides, can you be faithful in little? Then I can make you faithful in much. What's your attitude when things are going bad? That's an attitude I can bless if it's a good attitude. If it's a bad attitude, then you're going to have to sit there and let that be refined out of you. Because I have great things to great people. I trust people with tr that are trustworthy in their life. If you never trust him with little, if you never obey him in the small things, it means you can never, he can never trust you with the big dream that he has. And scripture puts it through this way in 2 Timothy. In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver. So in a wealthy home, God's home, some things are very valuable. Everybody can see it. But then he says some of them are just wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions. Hey, I've got something special to do. Hey, I'll come over here. I want you to meet these people. Hey, I've got this door that's going to open. Come out. I want you to walk through this door. You can handle this. But some of the utensils, he's like, no, nah, it's something special. You just sit there and breathe. I, I can't trust you yet. It goes on. If you keep yourself pure, you'll be a special utensil for honorable use. On the big days, in the big moments, God says, I want to use you because you've been refined in the process. You didn't fight the process. You kept your attitude. You kept prayed up. You, you, you challenged yourself. You grew. You didn't allow yourself to get beaten down, but you kept standing up when the pressures came. Your, your life will be clean, and you'll be ready for whatever the mas for the master to use you for every good work. He says there is a moment in your dream where you're going to be refined, and if you allow that refining to take place and you don't fight it and you don't throw yourself pity parties and you don't finger point and blame everybody, because by now Joseph could have been full on blaming everybody. He could have been triggered out the window. This is my brothers. This is my dad. And then you know, he had just gone on. But he didn't, Scripture says. Joseph decided in his heart, I, am, I have a purpose in me. And even when he was thrown in that prison, he decided there is a day of destiny for me that I am bigger than this prison. This prison is not strong enough to hold the dream that God has placed in my heart. There is a crossroads in my future where I'm going to step into a role of leadership. I may not be able to see it. I may not be able to feel it. But I know there's a dream in my heart and God is going to open that door one day. So my job in this process, my job in this prison, my job as a slave is to simply allow Allow myself to be refined and to be refined that God can trust me in the little because one day he can trust me in the much. Your goal is to control what comes out of you but even though you can't control what goes on around you. And what made Joseph such a powerful dreamer is that when the pressure was on, when the circumstances were on him, he did not allow the circumstances to get in him. He pushed them off and he said, no, God's got something greater for me. I will not yield to these circumstances. God has a plan for my life. It's kind of like you saying, listen, Eddie, I, you know, once I, once I have nice stuff, I'll be a good steward. You can be a good steward and not have nice stuff. You can be generous and be poor. You can be kind and still have a broken heart. You make a choice of what comes out of your life. And it kind of leads me to my next point with Joseph. Joseph really never lowered himself. 
Even though he was in prison, Joseph never acted like a prisoner. He never acted like that. He revealed the character of a man that would lead a nation even though he was living the life of a slave. The character of a, a leader was born in a prison. And the character of a leader outgrew that prison. And if you allow God to keep shaping you, you'll outgrow the prison that you're living in right now. If you live like a dreamer, you're going to see your dream. You live like a dreamer. Allow the dream to stay in the front of your heart and in your mind. It goes on in Genesis 39. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners over everything that happened in the prison. He noticed all the other prisoners were just being prisoners, but Joseph was being a leader. Joseph's bunk was made. I don't know how they did life back then, but every, something was different about the way Joseph approached his imprisonment than all the other prisoners. The warden had no more worries. For those who have a business, that's the person you want to hire, the person who gives you no more worries, because Joseph took care of everything. Anything the warden put in Joseph's hand was done. Warden would show up in the morning, Joseph, done. How'd that go? Done. How'd that go? Done. How'd that go? Yeah, it's all done. It's all taken care of. Don't worry about it, boss. I got it. That was Joseph, while in prison, while a slave. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Joseph never stopped working. He never laid down. He never threw himself a pity party. He always saw the dream as something that was around the corner. This was a delay, not his destiny. The reason God kept promoting Joseph is he worked hard and he kept a good spirit about himself. Even though he wasn't the dream, he knew that this was part of the dream. The key to the dream is the dreamer. If the dreamer dies on the inside, the dream dies. But if the dreamer keeps the fire going and keeps the refining process going, that dream is closer than it's ever been before in your life. So my question is, what is your dream? And what can you do to prepare for your dream? I'm not talking about everybody being wealthy and rock stars and famous. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what is the God-given potential that you know lives and resides on the inside of you. It, it, it's, it's a, it's, for Joseph, it was his lifestyle that opened the door. It was his character. It was his hard work. That was his dream to be this person. You may say, well, Eddie, I, I want to get married and and I don't know anybody that gets married. All my friends are married. I don't know how to find somebody. You know what you do? Stop throwing yourself like six-week ice cream pity parties, okay? And you go to your heavenly father and say, God, I thank you. There's a godly man. There's a godly woman out there. I don't know how you're going to get them to me, but, Father, I, I thank you for that. And then you work on yourself. And you be the best you you can be. You, you read about marriage and learn how to be the best spouse you can possibly be and pray in that person. You want to be a business owner and you say, well, Eddie, I'm working two jobs just to make ends meet. How does that even connect me to my future? Be the best employee because if you don't serve well, you're not going to lead well. The best leaders I know serve the very best. And so you decide, you know what, I will be the best employee at this business. I will get promotion simply because I do my job well. And then find local business people, maybe in our church, say, can I go buy your lunch? I have 10 questions. I want to learn how you started your business. What, what could you tell me how to start a business? Learn and continue developing yourself. You say, well, I don't have the capital to. I don't even have an open door to do it. It doesn't matter. The dreamer makes the dream take place. If you stop dreaming, the dream dies. And so you keep the dream alive. You keep fighting for it every day, one inch of a at a time. And one day Potiphar will look down and say, wow, look at how excellent you are. Let's take you to another level. This is your decision. You say, I want, we want to have a baby. Then get busy with that, whatever that dream is. Whatever it is. We want a house, then dream and say, God, how can you open the door? Stop saying, well, we don't have enough money. There's a way for you to get in that house and God can open that door. If it's a dream he's placed in your heart. Stop giving God reasons why he can't bring the dream about in your life. Stop telling God he can and say, God, if you place it in my heart, if the dream's big enough and it's from you, I understand that sometimes dreams are given out of context, but I also understand that I've got to keep pushing towards the dream you've placed in my life. Stop waiting for your dream to drop in your lap. If you ask Joseph how he got a hold of his dream, he worked hard every day for it. Joseph was a great leader because he was a great follower in whatever circumstances he was in. Paul talked about that in his calling. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But the grace of God, I am what I am. He goes, I am who I am because of God's grace. But, he says, his grace to me was not without effect. He said, I just didn't sit down in it. No, I worked harder than them all, all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. He says, yeah, I've got grace, and yeah, I've got a calling from God, and yeah, I have a dream from heaven, and yeah, I have a destiny in him. But I can tell you this, that grace did not make me lazy. I didn't lay on my sofa all day going, God, when are you going to bring about my dream? 
Lord, where's my dream? I have a word of prophecy from 20 years ago. Where is it? Paul said, I got out there and hustled like everybody else. I preached harder. I was the first one there, last one to leave. I dreamed. I worked. I grew. I confronted myself. I prayed through on the moments. I didn't let myself stop. I didn't let my doubt grow in my life. I didn't let bitterness grow when I was rejected by people and denied. When I was in prison, when I was stoned, I got back up, popped the dent out of my head, and kept on preaching the gospel. I worked harder than them all, and that's why I'm living the dream that I have. Because of the grace of God allowed me to stand up. When everybody else was laying down, God's grace just popped me back up and I kept going. You've got to be the, to be a dreamer, you've got to be willing to fight for your dream and allow the dreamer to be refined in the process of reaching the dream. Joseph survived betrayal and slavery and pits and prison. His dream still didn't come true. By this time in Joseph's life, he was a man. He no longer looked like the Jewish boy he was. He was now an Egyptian leader. Long gone was the look of a Jewish 17-year-old shepherd boy wearing his father's robe with the smell of the sun and the sheep in his clothing. He looked like an Egyptian, shaven head, shaven face. Through a series of events, he began to live in a palace looking like an Egyptian, but I'm sure there were days when Joseph was living in that palace. He began to, his thoughts would wonder to his family. Think of that. Never got to say bye to his dad and his mom. The last thing family touched that he had were 10 angry brothers mocking him as he was sold into slavery. There he is sitting in the opulence of his palace, alone at times, wondering and thinking about his family. Wonder how dad is. Wonder how mom is. I miss them. Wonder if I'll ever see them again. Even though he had done better in life than anybody ever thought possible, Joseph was not living his dream yet. One day, as the famine grew worse, he was the second in command, and he had this, the reason he became second in his command was that he was an interpreter of dreams, and he interpreted some people's dreams that were in prison, and then that allowed him to interpret the dream of the Pharaoh. And through that interpretation of the dream of the Pharaoh, it allowed him to be the second in command, and he came up with this idea, the God-given idea, that for seven years of, of bounty, they would, we would we'd hold so that in seven years of famine, we, we could take care of the nation, and not only the nation, but the nations that surrounded it. Now, during this famine, it began to not only spread beyond Egypt, but to the nations that surrounded it. Joseph's dad, Jacob, was unaware that his son was second in command. He thought his son was dead, eaten by an animal, decided to send his ten older brothers to go to Egypt to get some grain so their family could survive and would not starve to death in the barren conditions. So Scripture tells a story of how this band of ten brothers went to Egypt, and Scripture says that they bowed before this man who controlled all the grain and the resources of Egypt. For the first time, Joseph saw his brothers. And I thought about this. What would that be like? His brothers look the same, and that's what regret does to you. It traps you in a bubble, and you never transform. But Joseph, since he pursued his dream, looked totally different. His brothers didn't recognize him. Scripture gives us this detail that when he saw his brothers, he had to sneak away to wipe the tears from his, fa- his eyes because he saw his family. For the first time, the first part of his dream of his brothers bowing to him came true. This was a crossroads for Joseph. Everything that he went through all of a sudden now was put into context. This is why he went through what he went through. It's because God used him to help keep the dream of Israel alive. And this is the truth about every dream. Every God-given dream is for the sake of God's kingdom. By walking in his dream, he fulfilled the dreams of others. If you ever find a person truly walking in God's dream for them, they love to help others with their dream. If you find somebody who just only wants to fill their dream, most likely it's not a God-given one because they have to keep everything for themselves to get ahead. But God dreamers say, you know what, what's mine is yours. Let's get this together. Let's move the kingdom of God forward. So there was Joseph standing before his brothers. The one that was abused now had all the power to abuse that he wanted. He could do whatever he wanted to him. And so slowly through a series of things, he revealed himself to his, his, his dad. His, he ended up getting his dad there and his brother that he never met by his mom, Rachel, his younger brother that he never met in his entire life. And he united the family and brought the family to Egypt, took care of them. Well, his dad was getting older. He was 74 already when they had Joseph. So he was elderly and he finally passed away. The scripture gives this uh, story of how Joseph celebrated his dad and had this giant 
uh, Egyptian parade with soldiers to bury him like a royal and took him back to his homeland to be buried next to his mom. And Joseph came home with his brothers to the palace and his brothers, scripture says, came in one day out of pure fear. They thought, now that dad's gone, Joseph is going to kill us and our kids. And so out of pure fear, they came in and they bowed again before their brother and they just begged for mercy. And even though Joseph had been through a tough dream, even though he felt pain and he sweat and tears, even though he went up through all of this, he was not vengeful towards his brothers. To walk in God's dreams, you don't allow things that come into your life like bitterness, and greed, and all these things that distort your purpose. You're refined. You protect it. You kick out the ugly to only make room for the holy. You say, only God can live in this place. The only way for me to be the dreamer God's called me to be is I can't let that stuff in my heart. And that's exactly what Joseph did. So his brothers, they are begging for mercy. And Joseph said this to them, you intended to harm me. What you did was on purpose to hurt me. You knew when you did that, you would hurt me. There's no way you didn't know that would hurt me. But he says this, that God intended it for all good, all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of not only you as a family, but many people. He says, my dream that God gave me was actually bigger than I thought. I thought it was just y'all. He goes, but God sent me here to save nations, not just a family. And this is the truth about a God-given dream. God gives you the part you can handle. But there's a whole dimension to God's dream that you may, can't even understand the, 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 the rhythm of it. You can't understand how it cascades out and how many lives it actually touches. He says, no. He says, I don't want you to be afraid of me. I have no harm, no ill will, no hatred towards you. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by doing something to them that they never did to him. He spoke kindly to them. If you remember the first verses I read about the story was that Joseph's brothers never spoke kindly to him. But when Joseph had his turn and he was in the power position of authority, he did the exact opposite. He spoke kindly to his brothers. That's amazing. Because Joseph, I think, understood this. Regret can imprison you but dreams can transform you. And Joseph made a decision to be transformed by his dream, not to be transformed by regret. This is the key in our life. We outgrow the struggle to become the dreamer that God's called us to be. We understand that every dream has a process. Every dream has a process. Every dream should take us down to the foundation of our faith where you either choose God or your dream, you choose God. And then God chooses the dream for you. The scripture captures the heart of this for me. If you've gotten anything by, by, at all by following Christ, he says, if you've gotten anything out of being a Christian, if his love, God's love, has made any difference in your life, I mean, one hint of transformation. If being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if going to church matters to you one bit, this gathering today, coming to City Point, second service, matters to you, if you have a heart, even if you care, he says, then do me this favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top or sweet-talk your dream. Put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Help them with their dream. Help them to walk into what God has for them. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand to somebody else. Think of your ways that Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but he didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity took on the status of a slave and became human. Dreamers help others dream. That's what we do. We come along and say, listen, I'm fighting for my dream. You're fighting for yours. Together we can both reach, we can cross that line together. But in that process, there's a process where number one, those dreams show up out of context. The dream shows up in a place that doesn't make sense. 
That dream is going to be tried by fire, which means you will be tried by fire. There will be a day when it seems too far off, but you just keep pushing through. You wake up, put two feet on the ground, take a deep breath, get up that morning and say, God, I'm pushing one more day. Dreams require the very best of you at every level, at every level, at every level. There's never a day where you don't give your best for that dream. Every day you say, God, let me be the best that I can be. And the last thing is, a dreamer's dream is to be a blessing to others. If it's a God-given dream, it's somehow it's going to bless others. You say, well, you know, we just want to have a couple kids. Those kids are going to change the lives of everybody they touch. That's a God-given dream. I want to own a business. That generosity and that, that biblical culture that you build that business on can bless others. No matter what that dream is, if it's from God, it builds his kingdom. And as I was studying for this this week, God laid a type of person on my heart. And you're probably here today. And I did this first service. And if you allow me, I'd like to do the same for you. Is those who own businesses in our church. I've, I've talked to a couple and I know this, that your dream is under attack right now. There's a lot in the last couple years that you've really struggled with what you're going through. But I'm here to remind you, if it's a God-given dream, God's going to bring that dream about. Because dreamers dream to be a blessing to others. Let's all stand, and I want to pray for you this morning. In fact, before I, I do, if you can do me a favor, and I don't normally do this, and I, I'm just going to ask for you to let me to do this real quick. There's no other reason that I just want to pray. I want to know who I'm praying for today. And with every head back, well, let's do this first. If, if you're here today and you own a business, can you raise your hand? You say, that's me. If you also have a dream to start a business, can I see your hands? Can y'all, can y'all do me a favor? I, I'm asking a lot here. Trust me, there's no other motive besides I just want to pray for you. Can y'all come out of your seats and come down to this altar? And I want our church to pray for you this morning. I, I have compassion for business owners. As a pastor, um, your business owner... You, you don't go home from work. Work goes home with you. If there's a problem in the business, it, you go home with it. And God really laid on my heart to pray for y'all that the blessing of God, that even in times of challenge, there'll be seasons of spiritual innovation, that God's going to open up doors and there'll be favor in your life. For those who don't have it, who have a dream, God's going to put resources in your hands and God's going to open doors and give connections. And so church, I want you to stretch your hands towards these folks down here, these men and women. Father, I thank you for these dreamers, God, who feel like you've asked them to start a business. Father, number one, we thank you that every dream that's given from you, Father, that you are the one who pushes that dream forward, that we can rest in the fact that God is for us and who can be against us. Lord, I pray against fear and intimidation of the times we live in and economic fears and all those concerns. And Father, I just pray for the blessing of God. I pray for the wisdom of God. I pray for innovation in their businesses and ways to get around the problems that they face. But Father, I just thank you, Lord, that the enemy shall plan shall not prosper against them. That God, you are going to uphold them and they will be a testimony. That Father, they're going to be an influence to other business owners that don't have faith in you and they can talk about how you sustain them during the most difficult time in their business. Lord, I thank you for these business owners, Lord, and I pray that you would use them to further your kingdom. But Father, most of all, I pray that you give them peace and rest in the middle of the difficulties if they're facing that today. The Father, as they build this business, God, that they will trust you. The Father, you gave them this dream and you'll fulfill this dream in their life. And Father, we pray for them now as a church body. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God praise for these guys. Thank you for coming down and let me pray for you. We're just going to collect some quick data that I'll be used for eating. No, I'm just kidding. No, Y'all go back to your seats. I just want our church to pray for you. That's probably like, okay, wait, there's a class we have or something. No. The rest of us, all of us have dreams. All of us have dreams. All of our dreams are different in how they look. But I can tell you this, if it's a God-given dream, you can bet your life on that you'll see it fulfilled if you simply walk the journey that God has for you. God is not a liar. He's not a deceiver. He's not a con man. He's not asking you know, to do something to you that, that's not best for you. So I want us just to lift our hands to heaven. I want to pray for all the dreamers in the room. Father, I pray for all of us right now. Father, those of us with dreams, with hopes that are hidden in you. God, I pray for the, all of us as we walk this process of the dream arriving, the dream being tried, Father, that 
we begin to do our best at every level that we do this, Father. And I thank you that, Father, these dreams are a blessing to others. Lord, I pray that you would begin to work these things out in our heart. I pray for those who are weary in their well-doing, who felt like they've been fighting a long time, believing a long time, praying a long time, waiting a long time. The Father, I pray for longevity of spirit and patience and endurance and strength. The Father, they'll wait to see that dream awaken on the horizon like a sunrise on a dark night. Father, the dream is on its way and they're not too far. And I pray that, Father, that hope be awakened on the inside of them like never before. The Father, we're cheering them on today saying, you can make it. God's for you. Who can be against you? You're going to make it. And, Father, I thank you for these dreams uh, uh, being so strong in us, Father, that we can't lay them down. Father, I pray for those who've laid down a dream. I pray today that you help them pick it up and not be discouraged in their process of pursuing what you have for them, regardless of what it is. Father, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, it's hard to dream if you don't have a relationship with him, the God dream. But you say, you know what, Eddie, I don't want to leave here the same. I'm not talking about just knowing about God. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm talking about a relationship with God. If you don't have that, there's no reason for you to leave it today. Nobody's looking around. This is between you and your heavenly father. But scripture does say we need to make a public declaration of it. So if you're here and you say, Eddie, if you're going to pray that prayer, can you include me in that prayer? I want to have a relationship with God or I want to renew my relationship with God. If that's you, can you raise your hand real quick? I want to see who you are this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Others, you say, that's me. Who else? Stick your hand up real high real quick if you haven't already. Awesome. Thank you. Let's pray for those that, that raise their hand today. Everybody say this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. And I choose to follow you with all of my heart from this day forward. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's give God praise for those that made that decision. If you made that decision today and you're in this service, please grab this, put it in your pocket, your purse, however you transport paper materials, and text us at some point later today and let us know about your decision. We want to celebrate with you. Last thing I want us to do, and then we're going to uh, worship our way out of here, open up the altars because there's people who need prayer today. Don't leave here with something you don't allow somebody to pray with you about. I prayed with somebody earlier today, and they're actually in the process of starting a, a business, and, and they got another job, and they're like, we just need some grace. And maybe that's you. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's healing in your body. Maybe it's a child that's going crazy. Maybe they're like the 10 brothers. You know they're plotting something. You just don't know what it is. You need God's help. Whatever it is, we want to pray with you today been praying this over us as a church, that God will provide and increase our resources and produce a great har harvest of generosity in us as a church. We're taking those steps as a church, and I believe that there's some people in this room that just say, God, I want to be a conduit, God. I want you to use me. Father, not only, in, I'm not talking about just writing a check at a church or whatever, but at the grocery store, you turn around and God lays on the heart behind you, pay for that person's groceries. Maybe it's something you do, you buy a meal for a couple you just look across and say, hey, I want to bless them. Whatever it is, that, that generosity is just who you are. It's bringing shoes or bringing a teddy bear to the church. It's whatever it is, whatever the opportunity is, you say, God, I want to harvest the generosity. I want that to be my trademark thing that people know everything I have belongs to him. And that's what I'm praying for us as a church. So we'll receive our tithe and offering. For those who are giving a check or cash. There's envelopes in the back of your seats and collection boxes on the production booth. For those giving digitally, we have little QR codes, these little black cards, and they'll take you there straight to the giving. But before I pray, I also want to remind y'all that we are, once a year we do a heart for the house. This is an over and above, above budget item for us as a church. It helps move ministry forward. This year we're believing God for a church man. We found a better price, so we need about 60000 for the two things that we're believing God for. Um, right now, the church has a pickup and a Corolla that we do everything with, and we really would like to get a van uh, with our church's name on it. So when we do things like camps or even outreach, which Andrew did this weekend, where he we went and blessed somebody's home, then our team can go out there in a van and just be present and do that. So we're believing God for that. Um, and so I'm just asking you between now and November the 14th, as you pray, and just say, God, what can we do to make a difference in that? Um, scripture says in Isaiah 
generous people plan to do what's generous. And that's all I'm asking you to do. Make a generous plan. That's between you and your Heavenly Father. It's over and above. So that's our goal. The second thing we want to do is get a mobile check-in system for our kids. If you've ever been at Chick-fil-A and they have the person under the umbrella that takes your order, that's a mobile system. We want to have that so on our big busy days we can have somebody checking in your kids so you don't have to cut down on the lines that we have here at the church. But those are two things. Be praying about what you can do. Let's pray over our giving. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to give. Lord, we worship you with what you blessed us with. Father, I thank you that you are good and you're faithful. And Father, I pray for those that are just getting by, Lord. I pray that for you give them wisdom. And Father, I pray for jobs. I pray for promotions. I pray for open doors, God. For Father, you are our provider. There is no country that is. There is no boss that is. There is no business that is. It's you. And so, Father, we take our eyes off of those things and we put our eyes on you. And then, Father, even in the difficult times, Father, you can bless our lives and take care of us. For you, Jesus even told us to ask you for our daily bread. So, Father, we're asking you today to help meet our needs so that we can be who you called us to be and do what you called us to do. We thank you for this opportunity to give, and we choose generosity over anything else. In Jesus' name.